The North Atlantic Treaties Organization's mission in 1949 and throughout the Cold War was to deter and defeat the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact to protect the territorial integrity of its members and to stop the spread of communism in Europe. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has been the most robust alliance in the world with deeply institutionalized processes, yet it has faced significant problems in running. Our guest in our program is Jean-Louis Aman, a research advisor at NATO Defense College at the Middle East faculty. Jean-Louis Aman, welcome to our program. Thank you very much. Good evening. Well, Jean-Louis, could you tell us the origins of the alliance? Well, I mean, very simply, uh, there is one uh, definition uh, back in the early 50s that had been given on the origins of NATO. It was Lord Ismay, the first Secretary General of NATO, who said back in the early 50s that NATO was about keeping the Americans in, keeping the Russians out, and keeping the Germans down. So back in uh, the uh, 50s, the origins, I mean, the purpose of NATO was to make sure that the uh, American military would stay in Europe, that uh, it would counter or contain the um, threat of a Russian um, influence zone in uh, Europe or an invasion. Mm -hmm. And it it was also about making sure that the new Germany, the post-Second World War Germany, would not uh, turn into a new uh, competitors for hegemony in Europe. Mm -hmm. We know that there is no system of voting. Uh, And all decisions have to be unanimous. Extensive consultations and discussions are often required before an important decision. How does NATO really work, Jean-Louis? Well, I mean, as you say, uh, NATO, and this is something which is sometimes ignored, uh, works uh, with the consensus rule, meaning that of all the 28 members uh, currently affiliated with NATO, each of them has the right to uh, say no, meaning that if uh, suddenly uh, some uh, representatives of NATO want to uh, intervene in a country, want to uh, launch a military operation, any of the other uh, country uh, has the right to say no. So all the decisions are taken by consensus. Uh, so that is one, the, the first rule uh, of NATO. The other way to understand how NATO works is also to keep in mind that this is both a political and military uh, organization. You have two uh, sides of the building uh, in Brussels. One side is the military structure, the military committee, which is in charge of planning the operations, uh, making sure that uh, the conduct of uh, uh, operations is done in a very smooth way mm-hmm. between all the uh, the armies. But you also have the political side, which is in charge of the most important decisions, so which held the uh, consultations, uh, making sure that uh, all the countries of NATO uh, are on the same page when it comes to uh, major strategic decisions. Well, today's security environment is different from the past as uh, economic uh, globalization, privatization and the development of new forms of communication such as the Internet, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, on all these topics that you mentioned, uh, NATO, like uh, most of the other international organizations, uh, have been uh, following a process of adaptation, for instance, Mm -hmm. You mentioned cyber. This is also a topic that was barely recognized, I would say, um, 10, 15 years ago, by the NATO NATO structures. Today, you have uh, several committees uh, which have a a mission for uh, cyber operations, for cyber defense. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right now, most of the, the job that has been done by NATO in that field was about making sure that the networks, the communication networks used by NATO uh, structures, NATO facilities are protected from cyber attacks. Well, NATO began to transform its uh, military structures and forces to enable it to undertake crisis management, peacekeeping and peace support tasks. Could you please elaborate? 
Well, I mean, that was uh, something that emerged, I would NATO say, in the early 90s. In wars. And the idea was that... Uh, and that was uh, you either go uh, out of your area mm -hmm. or you go out of business. What I mean by that back in these days was that uh, NATO had to evolve from an, an alliance that was uh, working mostly or uniquely uh, for the protection of its territories, mm -hmm. but not working uh, or having any ambition outside of these uh, territories. But in the 90s, with the, the crisis that happened in the Balkans, uh, you had a new mindset, and people started thinking uh, NATO needs to uh, go from a defensive alliance to uh, an alliance that would have ambitions in terms of overseas operations, expeditionary forces, and so on. So that's how, if you look at the timeline of the 90s and uh, the 2000s, actually, uh, you clearly see an evolution of NATO with the interventions in Kosovo, the intervention in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the intervention as well uh, recently in Libya in 2011. Well, speaking about Afghanistan, how do you assess NATO's intervention in Afghanistan? Well, that's a, that's a <laughs> tough question um, because, I mean, sometimes it's not well understood that NATO uh, intervention uh, in Afghanistan uh, only started uh, in 2003 yeah. and not uh, at the beginning. Uh, NATO did uh, invoke Article 5, which actually this was the first time Article 5 of the NATO Charter being the, the article that uh, commits all the nations uh, to the solidarity with one of the members when um, one member is under attack. Um, but apart from that, the NATO mission in Afghanistan was mostly about uh, security assistance. Uh, so you had two different missions in Afghanistan, the U.S.-led uh, operation and the NATO operation. With regards to the NATO operation, and uh, it's still, I would say, early to say uh, on the long term uh, to exactly assess the, uh, I would say, the uh, outcomes of the operation. Mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, I mean, I would say that even the most optimistic people these days in Brussels would say that uh, the Afghan forces uh, are still uh, years uh, before to to be able to uh, secure on their own uh, the territory. Mm -hmm. So for sure, the NATO uh, operation uh, achieved some mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, objectives that were uh, stated back in 2003. Uh, but this doesn't mean that the, the, the country by itself is uh, far from uh, any instability these days. Speaking about uh, achievements, what are the main achievements of NATO? Well, I think uh, one uh, one obvious achievement, and which is sometimes underestimated, is that NATO contributed to a, a stability in Europe. I mean, mm -hmm. as I said at the beginning, yeah. the whole one of the core missions of NATO was to make sure that um, the U.S. military would stay in Europe because there was the assumption that if the U.S. leaves Europe, the European powers would get again in power place and uh, that we would see uh, a third uh, a third world war in a sense. Uh, so one element uh, of achievement I would say uh, is uh, that NATO contributed to this uh, stability in Europe mm -hmm. alongside the uh, European, Union, European Union, you could argue. Yeah. Uh, another achievement, I uh, would say, is uh, the fact that today, um, in 2015, you don't have any other international organization able to launch um, multinational military operation the way NATO does. Um, that's uh, basically the reason why NATO intervened in Libya in 2011. I mean, there was the UN Resolution 1973, which led to the NATO operation, but NATO was selected in a sense because there was no one else that could do the job. Um, I mean, I'm not uh, a 
I'm not a skeptical about uh, the EU yeah. project, but uh, unfortunately, if you have to compare the military and the military readiness of both organizations, today NATO is uh, much more able to launch uh, military interventions such as the one in Libya back in uh, 2011. Yeah. Is the transformation of NATO an ongoing process? And how about the NATO's enlargement? Well, uh, I mean, these are two different questions. With regards to enlargement, uh, this is something that uh, had been uh, a big topic back in the 90s and early uh, uh, 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that today um, this is less a priority than it was in the past. Um, there, are, there are some talks about enlargement, but uh, right now the uh, priorities of NATO are to uh, deal with the uh, uh, implications of the Ukrainian crisis and uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Exactly. Uh, for, with regards to transformation, uh, I would say it's an ongoing process, but it's also an endless process because uh, you always have to adapt your forces to the new security environment. And uh, in a sense, when you had the last uh, summit, the whale summit, mm -hmm. two years ago, um, before that summit, people were uh, thinking that the biggest topic would be the end of the war in Afghanistan. And suddenly uh, you had the uh, Russian intervention, uh, in Ukraine, and suddenly you had the rise of uh, the so-called uh, Islamic State in uh, Syria. So you always have to transform your forces to make sure that they uh, adapt to the uh, new security environment. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jean-Louis Saman, a research advisor at NATO Defense College at the Middle East Faculty, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to you.